paper entitled Agency and Inertia. Uh, this title is really an allusion to the two theoretical perspectives that I use to examine procurement corruption in the United Nations. So very briefly, uh, procurement is the process by which governments and organizations secure goods and services from firms in the private sector uh, in order to achieve their specific objectives. So when one thinks of the United Nations, one can think of objectives such as the maintenance of international security or the promotion of basic human rights. Um, and in order to pursue these objectives, uh, procurement is absolutely essential. So if you look, for example, at UN peacekeeping operations, in order for those uh, operations to function effectively, one needs food rations for the peacekeeping officers, clothing, uniforms, vehicles, fuel for those vehicles, etc., etc., all secured through uh, contracts with the private sector. Now, there's a procurement department within the United Nations with procurement officials who are charged with securing contracts with these private firms. And they're required to solicit bids uh, in an environment of free competition and ultimately to select the vendor who provides services at the lowest cost to the organization. The problem has been in recent years, that hasn't been what's been occurring. What's been happening is relatively higher cost vendors, suppliers, have been chosen to provide services to the UN because they're providing under the table kickbacks to these individual procurement officials. They're bribing them, essentially. So what I'm aiming to address in this paper is uh, I'm trying to explain this phenomenon, this widespread rampant misconduct. Uh, what factors explain the prevalence and extensiveness of corruption in the UN's procurement operations? And I use two theories, agency theory and structural inertia theory, both of which are organizational theories in the sense that they're looking at organizational phenomena, uh, members within organizations, uh, factors uh, emanating from the external environment of organizations. Um, and I think it makes sense to use this approach because procurement is fundamentally an organizational process undertaken by organizational members, so it only makes sense to use sort of an organizational theoretic approach. And I'll say real quick that this sort of departs from traditional uh, theoretical approaches undertaken by international relations theorists who tend to focus uh, primarily on state level actors, uh, political actors, uh, without as much regard to the autonomy of organizations or without as much regard to the ability of organizations, lower order uh, actors to have some sort of impact on the international stage. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at these two theories, I'm going to apply them to a case study of uh, procurement corruption in the United Nations. And this case study was actually crafted through a systematic analysis of all documents in the UN database pertinent to procurement corruption. Uh, so when I did this systematic analysis, I found out that there were 30 documents that talked about procurement corruption in the UN. Uh, and I also supplemented that with some leaked reports. Uh, Thanks to WikiLeaks, some stuff got out that the UN didn't want. Um, and so that's the basis for the case study. So real quick, agency theory. Agency theory looks at actors and classifies them as either principals or agents. Just to make it simple, one can think of employers and employees. So employers delegate certain responsibilities to the employees and expect the employees to behave in a certain way. Similarly, with principal agent theory, you have a principal who delegates responsibilities to a specified agent, and that agent acts on behalf of the principal in order to act in a way that's in accordance with that principal's interests and with that principal's wishes. Now, agency theory says that in practice, this oftentimes doesn't really happen because agents have their own interests. And so you have this difference between what the principal wants and what the agent wants. And this divergence of interests leads to agents pursuing behavior that isn't in accordance with the principal's want, and in this case, that's corruption. Uh, UN Secretary General, UN Member States don't want to see corruption, but individual agents uh, motivi motivated by opportunism, motivated by self-interest, they pursue corruption anyway. Uh, and so the causal story is this divergence in interest leads to undesirable behavior. Uh, an academic speak, I guess, uh, Asymmetric information is an antecedent condition. All that means is it magnifies this causal relationship. Asymmetric information is uh, a phenomenon in which uh, it's difficult for principals to adequately monitor their agents. There's not an equality of information there. So given this inability to adequately, adequately supervise 
agents to adequately monitor them, there will be more corruption in this, uh, in this environment of asymmetric information. So when we apply this to the case of procurement corruption in the UN, um, it doesn't really apply, and it's, I'd say that it does. I think it does a good job of illustrating what's been happening because you have these individual agents who are engaging in corrupt behavior that's completely in opposition to what the UN Secretary, Secretary General, the UN member states wants to see happening. Uh, you have uh, Russian procurement officials such as the Akavlev from 1993 to 2005 was engaging and was providing exclusive contracts to a variety of vendors in exchange for millions of dollars in kickbacks. You have uh, in DR Congo an official by the name of Mossery who was doing the same thing. He was also receiving sexual favors. He also received a swimming pool, that sort of thing, uh, in exchange for exclusive contracts to a variety of vendors, uh, suppliers of the UN. And this clearly shows that there's a conflict of interest between these agents and what the organization wants. So as far as the application of the theory, I think it really illustrates what's been going on with the UN. Uh, furthermore, I talked about asymmetric information a bit earlier. Uh, one would expect from an agency theory perspective that there would be more corruption in certain places than in others. In other words, there would be more corruption, I would argue, in the UN peacekeeping missions relative to places closer to UN headquarters. And that just is because of this asymmetric information problem. You would expect that because it's so much harder to monitor what's happening in these external peripheries, it's so much harder to supervise agents, that they'll be more likely to engage in corruption. And in fact, that's what's happened because if you look at the data, the data that I've looked at uh, from the official documents, 70% of cases of corruption have occurred in UN peacekeeping missions. Over $800 million of misused funds are due to corruption in the peripheries of the organization, the peacekeeping missions. So, and larger and larger that's due to this extended chain of principles and agents. You have uh, the interests of the main principle, the general secretariat, but then way far away from that, down this chain of principles and agents, you have the peripheries of the organization, peacekeeping missions, and it's very difficult to monitor what's happening out there. It's very difficult to make sure that those interests stay congruent. And that really explains, I think it really illustrates, that this theory applies well to the instance of UN corruption. The other theory that I use that hasn't really been employed by a lot of uh, political scientists is structural inertia theory. It comes from organization studies and sociology. And these theorists have basically talked about how uh, change can be a bad thing for organizations. So in other words, a lot of these theorists have said that it's good that organizations, well-established organizations, tend not to undergo fundamental change. Uh, these organizations have what's called a reproducibility of organizational structures. In other words, you have norms and attitudes that become institutionalized. You have procedures, standards, codes that become formalized within the organization. They become part and parcel of how the organization operates, and they tend not to change. And they say that's a good thing because that gives stability to the organization. Of, it gives a sense of predictability to organizational operations. Now, recent theorists have said this might not be a good thing because what if the norms that are being preserved are hazardous? What if this inertia is, pre is preventing fundamental change that would ultimately be beneficial to the organization, that would legitimate the organization? Um, and so that's sort of where I, how I apply it to the United Nations. I say that, yes, there's a reproducibility of structures that exist, Certain norms exist, certain procedures exist, so that the organization can be stable, so that, it can, so that it can survive. But this can lead to resistance to change that can be a bad thing. This can lead to certain things that uh, are allowed, such as corruption, that ultimately are not uh, very good as far as legitimating the organization. And then this produces a state of structural inertia, which essentially says that change happens very slowly, or change happens not at all. So when we apply this to the case of the United Nations, uh, there are a few insights that I had, uh, but looking at all the documents, uh, a couple themes really emerged, one of which was this concept of rigid rule following. So a procurement task force was established in 2006 by the United Nations due to a lot of public outcry regarding corruption in procurement. And this procurement task force, by all accounts, was extremely successful. Uh, the Procurement Task Force identified hundreds of millions of dollars of misconduct 
It, recommend, it pr produced a, a lot of recommendations as far as policy reform, um, and it identified over 600 cases of misconduct, specific cases of misconduct in just a two-year span. Uh, it was always intended as a, a task force that was going to be temporary. Uh, but what happened was the expertise of the task force was not ma maintained after it was dissolved. And therein lies the issue. Uh, you had two states, two countries, Russia and Singapore, who interestingly enough had most of the, most of the officials, uh, procurement officials, that had been accused of misconduct came from those two countries. And these two countries came forward and said, wait a minute, there's a human resources protocol here in the United Nations that says we, we cannot uh, transition these procurement task force officials and keep them as part of the United Nations still. So what they were trying to do was dissolve the procurement task force and allow these officials to work in another department of the United Nations and thereby preserve their expertise. Russian Singapore said, you can't do that. There has to be free competition for new jobs. So what happened was these people had to compete for those new jobs with new officials and then those new officials were hired. So people from the procurement task force who had resulted in a lot of good things, a lot of good policy recommendations, they were essentially kicked out of the United Nations, despite all the good work that they did. And that was because of this reproducibility of structures. Rules were rotely followed, rules were upheld at the expense of meaningful reform. Okay? Now when we look at another instance of this reproducibility of structures, we can look at how bribery has become normalized in peacekeeping missions. So uh, something that really came uh, out at me when I was analyzing the documents was that uh, in peacekeeping missions, in particular Congo, bribery is just the way things are done. It's, it's part and parcel of how things are done and you're expected to behave in that sort of way. And so in effect, bribery becomes a norm. It becomes a structure that's reproduced over time and therefore, it becomes something that just continues over time and not in a good way and ultimately leads to uh, a resistance to change that allows corruption to linger. Okay? So those are the two theories that I apply to look at corruption in the United Nations. I think both are very relevant. Both are extremely explanatory. They ex but they also explore different levels of corruption. So structural inertia basically talks about how and why corruption persists. It talks about how certain norms exist, certain procedures exist, which are followed and then allow people to resist change and allow a state of structural inertia to exist. Uh, agency theory, I think, is a bit more explanatory because it not only looks at why corruption persists, which is explained by that issue of information asymmetry, but it also explains the causes of corruption because at the root of it, Corruption is something that occurs at an individual level. It occurs uh, at an individual level in the sense that there is a departure, a divergence in interest between what one individual wants and what another individual wants that individual to do. So that principal agent conflict, that gets at the heart at why corruption occurs to begin with. Um, and so that's all I have for you this morning. Thank you.